All right, greetings from the dark continent, conscious Caracal here, Adams van Sale. And tonight we're going to be shining a light, not specifically on the goings on down south, but rather uh, the goings on in your backyard, uh, on your farm, and there where you where you plant your food and uh, everything that sustains you. And uh, joining me here tonight to talk about this topic is William Wheelwright. He is an online cultural commentator who, who uses agriculture as his primary connection to the past and vehicle towards the future. Welcome on the show, William. I'm uh, looking forward to it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Right. So uh, let's start off with a simple one, uh, seeing as uh, nobody knows yourself better than you. Uh, can you give us an idea of your, your journey? Did you grow up on a farm? Did you come from a farming community? How did this side of life uh, capture your imagination and your attention? Yes, I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm that wasn't really operating commercially as a farm when I was growing up. And when I finished school was when I decided to uh, come back and try and uh, revitalize it a little bit. We had a small number of animals here uh, when I when I started. Actually, before I left school, I was already embarking on this project uh, kind of over the summers and stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of my background. I, you know, um, had a, a series of options open to me um, uh, from from my from my schooling days and uh, and just sort of, you know, in, um, well, I should say just, just, uh, was a little disillusioned with, with, you know, kind of the, the different, uh, professional possibilities that, uh, were, were available to me. Um, and so I kind of took a bit of a risk and, um, decided to try and revitalize, like I said, uh, my family's place. And so that's what I've been doing for the last seven or eight years. That's fascinating because the fact is a lot of people find themselves in that position where after school they don't really know what they want to do. They are a bit confused about where their life, where their path needs to go. But uh, not a lot of them choose agriculture. And I mean, I can say this coming from a, a community that's very uh, agriculture centric. I mean, we called us, our cultural community, the Boers, called ourselves after the, the profession or mm -hmm. named ourselves after the profession. But still, it's a very niche thing. It's not, uh, I think, the vast minority of uh, um, kids when they're done with school, a dream of them going to work on a farm. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's not really the, the modern way. It's not something that uh, young people are encouraged to do. It's actually something that, uh, uh, almost there's a stigma to it it's like you need to the, every film uh, tells you the story of you need to leave the farm go to the city become an urbanite and then you'll be happy yeah yeah no it's uh it's definitely trending that way and has been for um close to a century now um yeah i think i think uh well you know um i would just wanted to do something that uh would would um i don't know give me a give me a sense of meaning in life uh, i think was the the problem for me um that's sort of a well uh you know not everybody has the the good fortune that i had to, to even have that option but um uh you know I, I just couldn't really picture myself doing something that uh basically felt irrelevant um you know which which i think a lot of uh at least for uh you know kids who go to school and stuff uh, uh, so much of the economy is basically you know, um, finagled uh, or not finagled, um, newfangled, uh, you know, kind of, uh, what I like to call private sector jobs program, uh, where, you know, so much of it doesn't actually, you know, much less have an impact. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything at all. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it's not necessary. If, if those jobs didn't exist, then nothing, you know, there'd be no difference economically speaking in the big picture. So that's, you know, going into something like that, which those sorts of jobs are what were available to me, uh, just felt like a waste of time and a waste of, you know, uh, my life. Um, and so farming, um, you know, in its, in its own small way, I think, you know, uh, having, having a bit of land to take care of, no matter how small or how big, uh, at least gives you a sense of, um, you know, continuity, um, with respect to like one's own mortality and, 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 uh, you know, place in, in not just the world contemporarily, but, uh, you know, in history and with respect to uh, one's family and so on. And so, you know, these sorts of things are what attracted me to, to the idea of it. Um, and also just, you know, um, I, I didn't want to be, uh, indoors, uh, didn't want to have to work indoors and didn't want to have to have, you know, you know, uh, an annoying boss and stuff like that. So, yeah, like I said, I was lucky to have the, uh, the land, but, um, the other thing, at least in America, I don't know whether this is the case in your country, but, um, you know, there is, there, there's sort of a, uh, I think 
there is a lot of land available um, to, to farm on, even if you don't own it. Um, and, you know, we can talk more about that. But uh, yeah, so, so yeah, that, that sort of was my, my thinking on, on going against, uh, against the grain in terms of like what you were saying, the, um, the sort of tendency to uh, denigrate farming as a, as a viable profession. Um, and, you know, th that's not done just purely for, for cultural reasons, like, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, discrimination against, you know, kind of rural people and rural lifestyles that is very common in, in American pop culture. Uh, but, um, it is, uh, it is, it's also done because, you know, economically it has been incredibly difficult for farmers, uh, in the last, uh, like I said, 70 or 80 years. And, uh, and it, it gets more and more difficult, uh, as time goes on and it's out of, you know, a sense of, um, a sense of, uh, what would you say? Um, altruism of some sort that, you know, like what you were saying, older farmers tell their children or, or their uh, young people that they know uh, not to uh, follow the, in their footsteps. So this all has to be uh, addressed and remedied, obviously. And uh, that's something that I'm interested in. Just to address one thing first, when you said the, uh, what's the case in my own country, in South Africa, the, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, um, opportunity to go into farming there is land available but there's a lot of uh, obstacles in the way one of these obstacles that's not a problem in the us is security mm -hmm. um as you are aware uh, there's a, a big problem with farm murders and rural attacks and the uh, attacks on farms in south africa so that security element is definitely a big obstacle there's also a uh, problem of scale and we'll get into that um, but to to get back to something that you mentioned there that uh, you when you do farming and when you work with the soil and work with the animals Mm -hmm. I've also experienced coming from a farming community. I've also experienced that when you work with plants or you work with animals, there's the, it taps into almost a, uh, a genetic memory, a generational memory that goes back to uh, down the chain. You just feel like you're doing something right that you should have been doing a long time ago. You just get that feeling of you're, you're in the zone. You're, uh, you're yeah. working in sync with your nature, mm -hmm. even if it's on a small scale, just planting some some vegetables in your backyard. You don't have to have a massive farm to tap into that energy. And I felt it definitely just working, working with the soil, working with animals. Your your psyche and your mind rewards you for the fact that you are uh, working in accordance with your nature and doing what your ancestors did for so long. Absolutely, uh, and and yeah, um, the connection with animals and and the. Um... And obviously, bro more broadly speaking, just the uh, the practice of growing something, uh, growing something for harvest, uh, producing a yield, a tangible yield. Uh, these are things that we've sort of been um, encouraged not to. <laughs> these, the, as you're saying, these sort of instinctual tendencies, uh, things that make us feel um, make us feel kind of at peace in terms of uh, in a you know living in accordance with you know uh, some sort of um, you know ancient primordial human nature uh you know working with working with animals working with land obviously people idealize these things but there is um a genuine i agree with what you're saying there is a genuine kind of um you know genetic thread it feels like uh going back i think particularly working with animals but it also applies to to crops and, and gardening and so on because it's all what i think the common denominator is is just uh you know caring for something stewarding something and watching things grow um watching real things grow, real physical things grow, as opposed to, you know, I don't know, some, like a software business or something. <laughs> right. And seeing, uh, seeing how fragile life is. I mean, a lot of people just look at farming and think it's the principle of taking seeds and putting them in the ground and then it just grows or the, you work with animals by just feeding them and giving them water and that's it. But when you actually start working with plants and animals and start farming uh, with them, you realize how difficult it is. It's really difficult, even on a small scale. I mean, I've realized this with my own uh, vegetables that I've planted. I mean, it, it, some of them work, some of them don't. There's a lot of challenges you have to get through. I mean, uh, your first, the first time you try it, then there's something like root rot or there's some mildew or there's some type of disease. Then you get it right, you fix one of those problems and then the next, next time they get uh, um, some type of mite or some type of uh, insect that, uh, that tackles and destroys them. And then you fix that problem, you get a new one. But eventually you start getting better. Eventually you start uh, aggregating, so you start building up solutions and accumulating solutions to all these problems. I've 
I just keep a notebook and, uh, and write down what I've tried and what worked and what didn't. Um, but it's it's not going to be easy the first time. It's not everything's not going to work. A lot of a lot of what you try is going to fail, in my experience. But it's that perseverance through it. You have to relearn so many things that your ancestors just knew. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, what's the expression? Tradition is the solution to the problems we forgot. Uh, yeah. Is, uh, and so, yes, uh, there's <laughs> there's so many things that um, that it, you know already. Uh, what, what we what we can inherit through books, and if you have, if you're lucky enough to know somebody, if you're interested in this stuff, and you're lucky enough to know somebody who you know is, has successfully done it, uh, you know, raised a, 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 an impressive vegetable garden, or has a flock of sheep, or something like that. Um, it just it's sort of depressing to realize this but what that person or that you know knowledge base represents is like a fraction of uh what you know there used to be that has been you know lost as agriculture has been industrialized as people have uh as you've been describing moved away from kind of you know their rootedness as, as people have become unrooted uh, all over the world and yeah lost uh especially you know in the context of a place uh the the um the uh the sort of you know plagues that you were mentioning the mold or or insects or whatever um you know these things are obviously all uh, specific to regions to bioregions and um you know if it's not like we can go to like indigenous amazonians and get their uh get their you know wisdom on um on you know how to grow carrots in in south africa it's, uh, it's all it's all very much uh related to um place and obviously there's um you know, I don't have to tell you. There's a uh, incredible, you know, richness and 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 value and depth uh, in in becoming kind of connected to such a place. Uh, you know, this sort of uh, adventure in in depth in time uh, as opposed to in space. Um, and and yeah, I think uh, I think you know, it's it's a, a question of kind of <laughs> rebuilding that, uh, figuring out how we can yeah. Uh, restart those things because so much of you know modern life is uh is uh has become kind of like you know um every generation starts a new kind of thing and and everything you know the past what's the past in general is looked at as kind of backwards and um and ignorant uh and so um figuring out for instance how to grow food something <laughs> something as you know um basic and you know primary as that uh, you know, you, you, you start to realize that there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, knowledge and wisdom, um, stored up in hopefully in the minds of people that you still have access to, if not in, you know, mm. books and so on. Mm. And there was something that you mentioned, uh, well, that's one of the reasons why I invited you. I've been following you for a while and, uh, but I, I, uh, listened to your conversation with Alex Kashuda mm -hmm. and you mentioned something there that I thought was very important to know. And this is the fact that, and I'm, I mean, if, if, if people look and my audience knows this, when they look at my channel, I've, I've tried to encourage people to just grow something, even on a small scale, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to teach you a lot of stuff unrelated to agriculture. Yeah. Um, but there is another thing that I think is a massive misconception and you did, um, you did, uh, attack it, uh, during your conversation with Alex and, it, and I think it's important that people understand this. The main point of starting to grow something or to start working uh, with, uh, start, uh, uh, domestic or, uh, working with domesticated animals or planting your own food mm -hmm. is not that it's going to give you this massive financial boost and now you're going to be financially independent and that's why you should do it. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost you a lot of initial investment, but it's the, the, it should not be a material, uh, reward that you're chasing. I mean, I'm definitely not making a profit with the, with my vegetables, but, uh, I'm getting a a lot of other benefits that you can't measure financially and you did touch on this the fact that you're getting a lot of psychological benefits it's uh, something that's uh, calming your soul it's keeping your your you keeping yourself healthy with something healthy with something that's good for you the food that you're producing is more healthy than the food you're going to buy in the in the shops one of my friends is a is a farmer mm -hmm. and uh, he told me when i told him i'm going to start my own vegetable garden about two years ago he said that uh, well that's the first good step seeing as if you saw what we do with the with the vegetables and the crops that we plant and that we sell to the shops you'll never buy them again yeah <laughs> yep yeah uh yeah definitely i think um to to address the first part yeah the yeah as i as i tell people the same thing grow something and the and the reason and and keep in mind that the reason that you're doing it isn't um 
may even not be that you're eventually going to eat it. Obviously, you do want to eat it because it's it'll be delicious, uh, whatever it is, whether it's vegetables, uh, an apple tree, or, or raising raising uh, some kind of animal. Um, but uh, and you know you'll you'll feel fulfilled by doing that. But the the real reason is um, is to, because it's going to enrich your life. It's a it's a meaningful and a uh, spiritually profound thing to do um, to at least participate. You know, um, people. I think like it's it's sort of the difference between uh, a home cooked meal and like you know fast food or like Burger King, you know, McDonald's or whatever. Uh, it's it's the same kind of spiritual difference. Obviously, there's like a qualitative difference as well, but um, uh, as in terms of you know the literal like and nutritional value and um, and you know how it how it makes you feel and so on. But there's a um, there's a spiritual difference as well, uh, which is just that um, you know there's something ineffable, as you were saying, something that can't be quantified um, monetarily in a home cooked meal. So how it, how it like you know it, it like you were saying it bring it it gives you peace and it uh, makes you feel uh, makes you feel spiritually uh, like I've been saying enriched. Uh, and I think it's similar for growing something. It doesn't again it doesn't have to be a full garden. It doesn't even it doesn't have to be. It could be herbs in a pot. Um, there's just something about it that, uh, that as we were saying, uh, and, or as I was saying in response to your last question, um, retethers you to some kind of, uh, you know, human essence. Um, and this is, this is what I think in the modern world, people are, are missing so much of and, and feel alienated from. And so, uh, I, I sort of, uh, proffer, um, you know, not agriculture, but just the, just cultivation of some kind of growing, growing one thing. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different options, um, uh, but just growing one thing as a as a way to sort of counteract uh, the sort of uh, atomization and um, kind of dehumanization effects of of, uh, of modern life. Uh, uh, so yeah, yeah. The 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 best antidote to uh, being constantly subjected to a, a dead world and a cold, sterile world is to w work with the living, to uh, to cultivate yeah. something living. And as you said, there it doesn't have to be a massive farm. It can be a herb in a pot. It can be something like a a, a small uh, garden in your in your backyard, or just a few pots with uh, with uh, medicinal plants or with uh, herbs in them or spices in them. Uh, this is something that uh, will give you that uh, spiritual rejuvenation that you're talking about just working with something living and i mean that that's even tenfold when you're working with animals because they, they also they, there's a lot more complexity there, there there's a lot more uh, i don't want to say uh, uh, consciousness there, there is more consciousness there but there's a there's a different type of uh, connection that you form with a living creature that's actively also uh, contemplating what it's doing and perceiving the world around it as opposed to a plant that's just pretty much existing there yeah yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, uh, the the animal thing is, uh, is is, yes, as you say, it's very, um, it's sort of like a next a next level type thing. I mean, obviously, uh, there's a sort of hierarchy of of which kind of animals <laughs> can provide you with uh, which kind of connections. Um, you know, I think it's you, some people may um, may feel a uh, may feel you know, emotionally, uh, <laughs> emotionally invested in, you know, like a chicken or a turkey or something. But generally speaking, I think uh, there's a, a greater tendency with, you know, sort of like, a, you know, more intelligent, uh, more mammalian um, type creatures, like, uh, obviously, uh, you know, people, lots of people have dogs and horses and so on, or lots of people have dogs, some, you know, and, and, and horses are another example of a kind of, you know, an animal that uh, you can um, connect with, you know, in a you know, like historically in a, in a kind of like co collaborator type way in the literal sense and that, you know, you're working together. Um, and, uh, but, but this, this need not be limited to like, uh, you know, working animals like dogs and horses and so on. This, the, this collaborator spirit, uh, or, or, or co-laborer spirit, um, you know, also applies to, uh, you know, cows and sheep and, and, and these types of things. And you can really, um, develop a, uh, develop a bond with them because, you know, you are, they are, uh, helping you if you have a small piece of land or a large farm, uh, to, uh, if you're managing them well, to, uh, keep the land healthy and, uh, and restore, restore the land to, to, to better health if it's, if it's been, uh, degraded or depleted. So, um, you know, uh, even though, uh, you know, you may, you may be intending to eat them or, or what have you, I don't think that this, uh, you know, it, it sounds, um, it sounds like an impossibility to sort of a, a rootless urbanite, but um, 
but the the fact that uh, the plan is to eventually eat these animals does not mean that you can't um, you know feel love for them or feel uh, um, you know a bond with them or feel you know some sort of kind of animal um, human animal connection uh, in a in you know a, a beautiful way tending towards that of that of you know um, like I was referring to the sort of you know uh, collaborate uh, collaborative um connection between between you know say uh humans and herding dogs or humans and, and draft animals and so on so um yeah the whereas obviously plants plants play a role in that whole um symbiosis they're not uh you know uh they're 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 kind of like less <laughs> less willing participants i suppose uh, mm. uh compared to uh you know uh, your cows or, or your sheep um and so you know there's there's a sort of gratitude a mutual gratitude there that you're taking care of them as you were saying there's a lot more involved in taking care of them than just uh like food and water um but and 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 they are doing something for you as well beyond just uh eventually um you know whether whether you know they may be providing you with food without having to slaughter them like in the case of dairy animals but um even if you are going to slaughter them there can be a, a mutual affection um because of the fact that you are sort of both working towards the same goal um mm. they're working for you and and you're working for them so yeah yeah and uh, well on that note uh, can you give us some examples of uh, what you've uh, what you currently work with what uh, animals you're 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 farming with and what if you do uh, what plants uh, your or crops you're farming with as well uh, just to to demonstrate your point uh, what you've already uh, what you've already uh, uh, tried sure yeah so i i have uh, you know uh, pastured livestock on the farm uh, so we have cows and sheep um don't have uh we don't have any pigs right now but pigs are a big thing that we also do um and then uh we do a bunch of poultry as well so we'll do we do cornish cross broilers uh we have laying hens a flock of laying hens um and uh and yeah we do th uh thanksgiving turkeys as well uh, for our uh, american holiday uh but um so so yeah uh and and yeah i'm doing a couple of different i'm doing some experimental things like uh we have we have a big pond that i'm trying to uh uh, get ducks to uh, lay eggs on um, without feeding them any grain, um, seeing if they can lay eggs just from the sort of you know aquatic uh, foraging that they do. Um, and so, but yeah, the um, the the main thing would be would be the 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 herbivores, the sheep and cows, and the and the pigs. Um, so, uh, for example, um, you know one 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 thing that we do with the pigs is uh, we you know so most of our most of the farm is forest and. Uh, that uh, is sort of, you know, agriculturally speaking, or um, yeah, agriculturally speaking, would be is considered kind of low value, uh, you know, in terms of the sort of um, current paradigms way of viewing land. You know, the only real potential harvest would be uh, of timber, um, and so you can do some of that, but you know, uh, it's not a really it's not a really viable economic um, livelihood to have like a, a finite amount of acreage and uh, you know be harvesting. Be, be harvesting once every you know 40 40 or 50 years uh, is basically uh how often you would be harvesting and so uh, it's just not enough value and so how do you how do you convert those those acres into something more productive um so what we've done is we've uh put pigs in those areas and um what uh but not only that uh what we've 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 used the pigs uh to convert as we've we've taken out certain trees and uh, allowed more sunlight to come kind of onto the forest floor. We've used the pigs because they have this, uh, as, as everyone knows, tendency to root in the ground and, and dig things up. Um, we've used them and basically make make a big muddy mess of everything, uh, but we've used them to uh, plant grass. So uh, what we'll do is we'll, we have uh, you know, kind of very basic electric fence paddocks set up for them. Where we can move them about twice a week, we move you know a group of twenty five pigs or so at a time, and um, so we'll move them onto a new spot every every uh, three or four days. And um, but the day before we move them, we'll take grass seed and just uh, kind of broadcast sow it in their in the paddock that they are currently in. And so over the course of the following twenty four hours, they will you know root that through and kind of rototill it in uh, and and tromp it in and make sure that there's lots of soil contact with the grass seed. And so, and, you know, with moisture and so on, and, and, and that's what kind of guarantees germination as opposed to just broadcasting it on the ground and hoping that it rains and, and whatever, it doesn't really, it's not anywhere near as effective. Um, and so once they've moved off, 
um, you know, within a couple of, of weeks of that, that whole paddock will be, you know, green grass, even though it's in the woods. Um, and so, uh, you know, a couple of years later, you can do that cyclically, cyclically. And um, within a couple of years, you basically have uh, what they call silvo pasture, which is just, you know, wooded pastures, grasslands and wooded and woodlands combined, kind of a savanna type effect. Um, and you can uh, suddenly start grazing uh, sheep and cows on that same grass. And so that increases the value of a given acre or a given square foot, um, you know, drastically. And so this is one way where you can actually use the animals to do a lot of work for you um, and, and not, you know, um, and, and, you know, uh, whereas you'd otherwise be, if you were trying to value add a, an acre uh, with machinery or with, you know, human laborers, it would cost you a lot of money, but you can be raising pigs for profit and then be using them as, <laughs> as literal farm workers for you at the same time. So mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing uh, works quite well. Right. And uh, yeah, when you mentioned the, the, the egg laying um, hens that you have, I've, I've also experienced where, for example, my parents still live in the, in the countryside. I uh, unfortunately live in the city. Mm -hmm. um, but when I visit them, uh, they've got some, some hens that are uh, running around true uh, um, free range, not, uh, not the free range that you get in industrial society where they just walk around in a little one meter by one meter block and it, uh, it uh, qualifies as free range. But their eggs are orange, so yellow they are. And then if you go back to the city and you buy some uh, eggs in, in the city again, you just get you just see the difference. You just get these almost colorless <laughs> egg yellows. Yeah. Um, and you never want to go back. But I mean, it's not uh, it's not. Uh, it's not possible to to always have your own chickens in in an urban setting. So, but I wish if I could, I would definitely have them. Yeah. Um, but it, I mean, the difference is so stark. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, yeah, you really do see it in the not just in the flavor, but in the yeah, like the the physical qualities of eggs are obviously a, a great example. But uh, that everyone can that everyone's kind of uh, uh, experienced. But uh, you know, even just uh, even just cuts of meat, um, the way the way they look there, uh, you know. I, uh, like nicely, nicely um, marbled and um, and and fatty uh, pork chops uh, that have uh, yeah that have you know this beautiful like pure white fat as opposed to the sort of like gray <laughs> uh, like uh, anemic looking uh, store bought pork chops. Uh, you know, it's yeah, it's just uh, yeah, you, you you these sorts of things like uh, the aesthetic beauty of a uh, of food. Um, it it makes a big difference, and uh, you know. Yeah, and you can uh, if you're if you have space, uh, you can um, you can you can do these things for yourself. And and uh, you know, as you were saying, it's the first time around. It tends to be um, it tends to be a, a, a project that that will uh, that will cost you money. But as you as you learn and as you gain experience, um, you can actually you know be doing this if if it's if if someone is is financially constrained. They can, you know, with with the, enough experience, that experience can it translates into, you know, economic value in terms of in terms of savings and so on. So it's it's worth doing. Hmm. And uh, yeah, before we continue, uh, I've got some uh, questions here in the chat that I want to uh, give some attention to. So Indy, firstly, is just a statement. Says uh, my cousin, uh, uh, she just started dating a young South African farmer who moved to North Dakota. Nice guy, probably probably an Afrikaner. Very strong chance. Um, and then uh, Indy also asks a question. He says, William, what is your experience with regenerate farming? Have you heard of Gabe Brown from North Dakota? I do know Gabe Brown. Uh, he's, uh, I don't know him personally, but uh, you know, I know his, uh, his, his message and his, I've read his book. Um, he's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very cool. It's very, uh, he's sort of the first guy, it seems, to actually be applying um, certain you know what would have been thought of as niche principles still probably are niche principles with respect to you know land management to a very much you know you know broad acre industrial midwest uh um machinery machinery intensive form of agriculture um and it's you know it's very very cool the way that um for example he integrates he integrates uh you know um, you know, one, one of the great, uh, I'm going to uh, <laughs> do a little roundabout here. One of the great catastrophes of the last 70 or 80 years in agriculture has been the segregation of animal and, and crop agriculture. These things uh, have, have never been separated like they are now until um, until the last, you know, the, starting in the 1950s. 
um, and obviously the you know the reliance on um, on um, you know abiotic fertilizers as opposed to on manure and um, animal fertilizers, animal-based fertilizers is uh, has been disastrous uh, in terms ecologically and in terms of um, farm economics. Um, and Gabe Brown, uh, I think the best thing that he's doing is is integrating livestock and and cropland um and you know so what he'll do is he'll take uh a field which he practices 100 percent no till he doesn't till the ground at all he just plants direct he's he's come up with a system where he's able to plant directly into it and not have to deal with um not have to till the till the till the actual earth and so uh and you know he can plant um like a a, a sort of special specialized um forage crop of you know different um different things that uh, will be good for the soil, but also are, you know, edible for cattle and, and he can just graze that. And, you know, the next year he can, he can plant because it's been fertilized now by the cows, he can, you know, just uh, costlessly plant uh, like corn or another cash crop there. So, um, you know, it's very cool. Uh, things like that, I think are, are awesome. I'm, I'm not practicing that form of broad acre uh, machine intensive agriculture. I'm kind of up on a, a bit of a hill farm uh, in poor country, but uh but uh yeah that's uh that i think that's really cool and it's you know there's different applications to these same principles in, in all different contexts so mm. before we get to uh, another question here in the in the chat uh there was something that didn't while you're on the topic of uh, the the agricultural literature that you read this is a fascinating topic for me because everyone always in these spaces just talks about the political uh, literature that they read and they're not enough about uh, there's not enough people actually talking about uh, agricultural literature that they're mm -hmm. reading um, you mentioned there was a, a, a farmer or agricultural thinker, whatever you want to call him, in Australia as well that writes about water management. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned this on Alex's channel. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Sure. Uh, yeah, I was referring to P.A. Yeomans, um, Australian. Uh, he's passed away now, uh, but Australian. He was, a, he was, I think, a miner, a mining like hydrogeologist of some kind, but he had a big farm uh, in Australia, I think multiple properties actually, and he um built he, he sort of uh, i think was kind of like a, an autistic uh, type brain and uh he he discovered um a kind of you know the the sort of ideal method for uh holding and retaining water in the landscape in arid areas where obviously you get um uh, such as in much of africa you get uh rain for a brief period through uh in a certain time of year and then it's dry most of the rest of the year yeah, and droughts so, and flood droughts and flood <laughs> yeah exactly so holding you know in that sort of context as opposed to um you know in in europe or in uh, eastern north america where it's sort of just consistent precipitation uh, all year round most of the time uh which is obviously nice but um in in most of the world's land uh the the retention of water uh is is sort of um is, is pretty much the, <laughs> the first limiting factor to uh you know um the, the 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 biomass productivity of any given uh piece of land and so um basically what he did was he he built it, it, you know i won't get into the specifics of uh the details of how this works but he built ponds uh many many ponds all across his landscape um and he he also built um kind of flood irrigation style uh swales or trenches so ditches that that run across the landscape at very um, almost imperceptible angles, but that, uh, you know, basically, uh, are, are meant to be sort of, uh, infiltration irrigation ditches, um, and that he could pump the water out of the ponds into. And so, uh, essentially what this did was it enabled him to spread the water resource out o across time. So it would rain for, you know, rain very heavily, actually, you know, in most of these places, it, I, I'm not sure about the, the precipitation data in, in, in uh, South Africa or, or Australia or wherever he was, I think it was in Victoria, but um, he, uh, uh, w what I was gonna say is that, you know, like in Arizona or um, or other very dry areas, south Southwest US, uh, there's still enough rainfall every year to, to grow stuff. It's just that it comes in such a concentrated period of time um, where, and, and sort of, you know, the more productive a place is, at least in the modern form of agriculture, it's basically just a, a factor of, um, of, uh, of of you know the sort of distribution of rainfall across across the you know the growing season, uh, and um, there are certain places where basically whether or not it rains enough is the like make or break <laughs> uh, factor. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of the, the the Midwest area, but in the foothills of the um, 
of the uh, of the Rocky Mountains and states like Nebraska and Kansas, um, they uh, are, are where it's kind of it's it's dry, but it's also flat and it's there's you know it's so it's agri- it, it has to be agricultural, so they rely a lot more on um, on cattle and so on there as sort of a hybrid form of agriculture. But anyway, uh, I was going out, that's a tangent. Um, but so PA Yeomans, he um, he uh, yeah, so he he figured out how to essentially um, take take the take the water and store it um, throughout the course of the year. And so this is a you know it's it, there's a, there's sort of an interesting debate here. Like uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Alan Sa- Savory, the uh, the uh, Zimbabwean um, uh, um, ecologist and and sort of grazing. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah he, he's sort of well known in these circles uh, he's he's gotten qu- he's quite old now but uh in the 80s he sort of came up with a lot of these grazing concepts but he's you know uh understandably kind of anti all of this stuff because it involves a lot of intervention and you know uh uh you know ch- literal earth moving in the landscape and and you know uh mechanical intervention in the landscape and these things are you know uh, whether <laughs> just it's just questionable whether or not that's a, a viable solution for you know, massive millions and billions of acres that would need to be regenerated in order to sort of bring about uh, the visions that people like he like he have for for you know these sort of more arid and and generally impoverished areas of the world that constitute most of the world's land. Um, but you know, and his his argument would just be that like when you restore soil uh, and rebuild soil through grazing, um, you can you, the water is just stored in the soil, uh, you know, perpetually. It doesn't doesn't evaporate because there's enough litter. Uh, or, or um, you know, biolog- you know, grassy material on the ground to actually preserve uh, the hum- the humidity in the soil, the moisture in the soil. So, but anyway, um, I still think that I'm sort of in between. I am sympathetic to that argument, but I think if you can build ponds like PA Yeomans, um, if you have the machinery and the and the and the financial means to do it, uh, it it can't be a bad thing because it also uh, it provides its own. Uh, Meet, you know, potential for productivity, uh, as I was mentioning about the ducks uh, and also, you know, aqu- aquaculture, fish systems, these sorts of things, um, you know, it, they, they may or may not be viable depending on, um, you know, how, like the ponds are obviously irrigation ponds, so they need to be used to uh, the water, <laughs> they, they get, they do get emptied out and, and drained out. Uh, I think PA Yeomans had a, um, his sort of motto was like, never end, never end a drought year with full ponds. Uh, because you should be using the water. It's not just, they're not just there for like aesthetic purposes, you know, although it is quite beautiful. The pictures of his, his property are, are pretty amazing. Um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, I think that uh, that answers the viewer's question. Um, William, on that note, you were talking a little bit, you mentioned uh, uh, mechanization and machinery. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is something that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, it's almost the, the other side of the coin. We've been talking about the regenerative properties of farming, the wholesome side of farming, but there is a dark industrial side to it as well. And we're, we're clearly being more um, uh, exposed to it by the day. Mm-hmm. And that is the the mega farmers and the, the industrial industrialization of farming. Uh, in our age, we are living not just with centralization in the power uh, of the state all across the world and uh, the centralization of power in the hands of states, but also uh, the centralization of power in the hands of corporates and uh, in, the, in the hands of uh, big agricultural uh, entities and big mm-hmm. agricultural mega farmers. Mm-hmm. This is the trend of our age. The trend of our age is not towards decentralization at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the that's when at the beginning of the stream I was talking about some of the hurdles that uh, young farmers face, and one of those hurdles is definitely the the hurdle of scale, where it's you just can't start a farm uh, that easily with just a cow and a plow and a horse nowadays and a bag of uh, seeds. Yeah. Um, so I would like to hear some of your thoughts specifically on uh, on specifically that industrialization and uh, just centralization of and mechanization uh, of farming in the modern age and the, what effect that's had. Yeah, well, I think um, there's a misconception that uh the the thing that you know there's some sort of like free market in agriculture uh and things are the way they are because it makes sense for them to be that way um in in some way and that's obviously just not the case uh doesn't make sense for an industry to you know in america for for the 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 you know um small business owners of that industry aka the farmers who are basically small business owners uh you know, three million of them in america the uh, industrial scale basically all of them industrial scale what you're describing um machine drivers uh uh 
driving um, yeah uh, plows and 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 spray and uh, different implements that um, that you know plants produce uh, plants care for and harvest corn and soy almost you know for the most part um, these these guys aren't doing it like that because that makes the most sense for them. I mean, well, it does, it does make the most sense for them, but in a, in a, um, in a very kind of, you know, uh, convoluted and perverse system where, uh, th those sorts of, um, that where that's basically their goal is to keep their farms in their family's name. Um, and there's a, a tremendous amount of, uh, financial pressure on them in terms of, uh, having to keep up with having to take loans to keep up with, um, mortgages and uh and you know equipment loans and loans for even basic stuff like seed like you were saying um because a lot of this stuff has just been as as yeah been been sort of commoditized seed is obviously uh, a big example that people know about with monsanto and so on um whereas you know before people would have just saved seed from the previous year now that's with gmos that's becoming more and more um less and less viable um and so uh well i think that um the the answer to your question is that the 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 system is the way it is because of policies that um that are designed to make it be that way because that these the way it is right now is very beneficial for um agribusness uh so when and when i say that i'm not talking about um you know uh the, 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 most of american farmland is still farmed by quote unquote family farmers but more and more of the of of what they sell in the form of their harvests, uh, more and more of uh, a given dollar of their sales, uh, you know, at the at the grain elevator, is being paid to um, uh, seed producers, um, chemical fertilizer and herbicide, pesticide, fungicide producers, um, and obviously uh, financial uh, lenders because uh, of the fact that they're either the land itself or and or their equipment is is levered to is 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 you know is bought on on uh on credit so um so the um th those those four thing those things all are relatively new situations and they are that way because of policies such as crop insurance where you know if your crop fails if you're growing a certain crop uh you know a, a small range of crops and it fails then you can be uh reimbursed at a certain price by the u.s government um and other things like this um it's not <laughs> It's not like this because you know, um, because uh, like there's some sort of <laughs> free market explanation for it. Um, it's it's not a free market at all. It is the way it is because uh, um, it's designed to be that way for the benefit of of certain interests. So um, if if there were if there you know if there were a um, a sort of a power in in office say or in in the sort of uh, you know <laughs> USDA kind of uh, agricultural agricultural deep state uh, if you will they you know if we wanted to benefit farmers i mean what you would do is get rid of crop insurance get rid of all that stuff um and and you know probably have a loan forgiveness program for farmers uh you know there's more there's more agricultural or there's about half as much agricultural debt as there is student debt in the u.s which is a huge you know political issue to whether or not we should forgive student debt but like you know mm -hmm. there are lots of other forms of debt too uh, that like you know maybe that, that, that could uh, be forgiven under the same arguments that the student debt people make. Um, mm -hmm. Agricultural debt being one of those because farmers are sort of roped, have been kind of like lured into this situation over the course of many decades and over the course of generations. So, you know, decisions made by fathers or grandfathers in a certain context are now being the, the, the fruits of which, uh, the, the unforeseen kind of bitter fruits of which are being harvested now uh, by, by their descendants. So, um, it, it, you, you see what I mean that it's not like it's not their fault that or, or you know maybe there's some argument that they shouldn't have responsibility for that um, blah 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 and also just you know it's in the interest of uh, <laughs> any serious nation um, uh, as opposed to I don't know uh, some uh, like a, just a, a state that is that is uh, occupying that nation um, to uh, you know um, support and um, have the uh, have the best interests of its farmers and its kind of you know primary producers at heart, and so um, you know what what maybe you would do is in addition to um, uh, getting rid of crop insurance and getting rid of and, and you know a sort of uh, some sort of debt forgiveness program for for, for agricultural debt, you would um, yeah encourage encourage farmers to to practice through through various means to practice forms of agriculture that are actually economically viable for them on their own merits. Uh, 
And so that would mean uh, a, a massive transfer away from annual crops towards uh, perennial crops because, uh, or perennial, perennial plants. Um, and so that, that, because those things don't need to be, um, don't need to be planted every year and generally don't need uh, anywhere near as much kind of, you know, um, herbicidal or pesticidal maintenance as uh, say corn, soy, wheat, oats, and so on. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, just general infrastructural support for figuring out how to um, channel that uh, resource uh, through some sort of system, uh, grazing system and so, or, or, or what have you um, so that it can be, you know, transformed into some kind of viable, um, you know, food product for which there is demand. Yeah. yeah and there, there's a, there's a thing to be said about industrial farming that it has uh, enabled or it, it has uh, created a abundance of food for a lot of people. But at the same time, there's a, there's another side to it that I don't think is uh, discussed often enough. And that is the quality of the food that it is producing in abundance. I think mm -hmm. a lot of the, modern diseases or diseases of modernity and afflictions of our to our bodies of a modernity can be traced back to what we're eating and what is being put what is being put into the process of producing that food whether it be uh, meats or uh, or even uh, vegetables and plants and grains um, I think a lot of a lot of the pesticides that go into that process are having a major effect on a lot of the the, the major illnesses that we're experiencing and I also think uh, uh, a lot of the the low quality of food that's being produced just because all the 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 premise or the the drive is that food needs to be produced as big as possible as fast as possible so you have these battery chickens that are that are as large as a small dog but they uh if it gets too hot they can't even breathe or they uh they just sit all day um mm -hmm. they're designed to uh get as fat as possible as quickly as possible a lot of fruits and vegetables and are also just genetically engineered to get as large as possible and as fast as possible with not really give a focus on nutrients and a lot of not a lot of focus on just being nutrient dense and rich mm -hmm. um but on that note and i think that's definitely a symptom of uh, uh the dark side of the industrialization of farming would you say the industrialization of agriculture and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race? <laughs> um, I, well, I, I'm not against, you know, industrialization as a concept or, or at least not. Um, I mean, maybe I'm against industrialization, but I'm not against like large scale. Um, you know, I think one of one thing that I always uh, that I'm always mentioning uh, when talking about this is that, you know, the scale of nature uh, continues to dwarf uh, the industrial scale. Um, uh, there's there's and you know historically that's especially true. There 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 are still more. There were more bison or buffalo uh, in in North America than there are um, cattle today uh, between the beef and dairy industries. Uh, and so and and those animals are larger than cows. So in terms of the actual live weight on the continent, um, the uh, the um, you know the 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 buffalo represent more pounds of of you know herbivorous <laughs> herbivorous you know meat uh, flesh than than there are cows now. So point just being that nature can can sustain um, a larger and more vibrant and more kind of uh, symbiotic uh, system of life than uh, the the sort of you know industrial system can. And so if if human beings uh, instead of you know instead of opting for this sort of reductive, uh, um, you know, industrial kind of like concrete and, and barn and big barns type system that we have now, uh, were to kind of try and extract principles from nature that, um, that, uh, they could use to, uh, inform their management of animal systems. Then, you know, I think that they would find, and I found on my farm that the uh yields would increase um because you know nature actually is evolved or you know has a will has a desire to um you know be be managed in a certain way uh the, and by nature i just mean the, the soil systems in, in concert with the plant systems in concert with the animal systems and everything that relates to all three to those three sort of flywheels if you will um mm. and um yeah and so uh the, this the, and that can happen at an enormous scale uh, with enough with enough you know people involved. Um, I think that's another big problem is that as we talked about at the beginning, there is a huge move um, away from farming uh, in terms of you know the sort of telos of of the of the modern agricultural system ideology is eventually to have no humans in in farming to have it be mm -hmm. totally AI slash uh, you know robot 
driven and um, you know for decisions to be made on some sort of like uh, machine learning basis. Um, and obviously, I think that that would be a total disaster. Um, and the, I think we need more people to get into farming. I think we can make it easier for people to get into it. It's obviously, as we've been talking about, there are challenges and obstacles to that now in, in many different countries. But um, if we are to, if we are to um, come up with a form of agriculture that doesn't um, result in uh, you know, uh, obesity and, and chronic diseases uh, related thereto, um, then we are going to need to, um, then we're going to need to, yeah, fundamentally rethink the way that, uh, like, our our what what agriculture even is, uh, in, and because right now it's as you say, basically it's it's the maximization of calories, um, yeah. and it, and it treats it treats uh, even the biological components of its system as mechanical, and you can see that in just the you know GMOs is a great example of that that the sort of <laughs> the sort of hubris to literally like edit uh you know genomes um uh, is is kind of you know a, a the the ultimate example of that really of the the sort of um the 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 recasting of of biological systems as as mechanical or as you know just you know they need to, it's like input output like we, <laughs> we plant it we plant corn in the ground we get calories to ship to like egypt you know uh right. six nine months later uh so um the point just being um point being that you know um there are other ways to look at it, and uh, nature offers us a uh, its own her own alternative um, uh, that we can that we can emulate and with with better results and better yields uh, because we know that there were <laughs> there were uh, better results before um, if, uh, if um, we think about it in a different way. Uh, but that would, that obviously um, requires, as I as I've also argued, you know, uh, a, a, a bigger a bigger shift in the way things are thought about because I think agriculture is is very much intrinsically uh, tied and even um, uh, prior to the way that uh, you know the sort of more you know cultural um, cultural ideologies that we're that we're that we're sort of talking about at the same time when we talk about these agricultural mm. issues. Mm. So, William, as we uh, start uh, approaching the end now, we've about got about uh, eight minutes left. I'm going to take two more uh, questions from the chat and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, just here's a very quick one. Uh, JS asks, what kind of climate uh, are you located in roughly? Uh, it's a temperate climate. Uh, we get we get plenty of rain. Um, uh, so it's uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm in, in the hills a bit. So we uh, we deal with uh, the effects of gravity. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, and we have we have cold winters here, so um, yeah, uh, it's di obviously very different from South Africa. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I reckon so. And then the last question uh, from the chat before we uh, wrap up is from Morgan Allen, who asks, "How does crop insurance lead to heavier reliance uh, on loans and centralization?" Well, uh, crop insurance, I think, is essentially. Um, so just for, for those who don't know this, it's, it's basically, um, I mentioned, I, I described it briefly earlier, but the USDA, United, United States uh, Department of Agriculture, um, has a, uh, founded by Abraham Lincoln, by the way, uh, has a, um, a, a program, uh, I don't know how long it's been in place, but you know, not more than a few decades, uh, by which it ensures, um, uh, basically farm, farm, um, yeah, farm productivity, farm yields um, for, uh, you know, certain crops. And what that means is that if a crop gets damaged, uh, say by hail or some other problem, then uh, you can apply to, um, to you know, uh, get a payment um, for, uh, you know, to, to like comp to, yeah, compensate for your loss, just like any other form of insurance. Uh, but there's obviously taxpayer subsidized. It's not like farmers buy this insurance uh, or have to buy into it themselves. Um, and basically what that does is it um, encourages farmers. And, and the point of the program is to encourage farmers to grow certain things. Um, <laughs> and um, when you're, you know, so when you're locked into a mentality, because obviously it's just a guarantee that basically no matter what happens, you won't lose the farm um, if you're growing certain things. Uh so, um, and that's, as I mentioned earlier, the, pretty much the, the number one driving, not pretty much, it is the number one driving 
uh, motivating factor for uh, any farmer, you know, still farming in America today is he just wants to keep his farm in his family's name and he will do whatever the economic um, circumstances uh, make sense or, or whatever the economic circumstances determine that he should do in order to um, achieve that goal. And so when the United States government says we will essentially, uh, you will get paid no matter what if you grow corn and soy and you know a, a small number of other crops, then, um, <laughs> then it makes sense to grow those things. Uh, but the thing is that it's not like those loans uh, or those that insurance covers like um, uh, it, 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 if even if you grow those things, you can still lose money um, because of the because obviously uh, it costs more to grow it than than the insurance payout is <laughs> or the mm -hmm. uh, the sale is at the at the uh, at the grain elevator. So um, it's it's really just a, a way of incentivizing certain crops. Uh, be, the crops that are that are famously most widely grown you know like <laughs> it's not it's not normal for for 80 percent of the whole continent to be growing the same thing uh you know that's there like it's not normal for the same thing to be grown in alabama as it is in uh north dakota you know there should be different things grown in those places because uh they're suited to um different um to different crops and different uh, forms of agriculture. But because the US, the, 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 common, the common denominator is that both of those state, both of those places are states in the United States of America. And uh, they both, the farmers in both of those places have access to the USDA crop insurance program. Um, so uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question makes sense mm. because you know, the, uh, to, to, to reduce it down to simple, simple terms, basically the crop insurance program encourages, is a way of encouraging uh, farmers to grow certain crops that then uh, lead them into into further indebtedness uh, to you know agribusiness interests that they they have to get loans for. And this process also, you're, you're asking about centralization. This process also, um, you know, it just it causes farms to it, even despite itself, it causes farms to fail at a greater rate. Uh, and so when farms fail, they uh, become centralized. The the neighbor buys you out. So um, yeah. Hmm. And they are just, uh, I think, public uh, enemy number one when it comes to uh, crops that are just grown everywhere. When I've, I haven't visited the U.S. yet, but uh, when I when I see farming in the United States, ninety nine percent of the time it's just corn, yeah. and then you end up with like a surplus of corn, and then you guys just turn it into corn syrup and put that as an ingredient into every food imaginable just to up the calorie content. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. or, or, or ship it to. Uh... To you know, uh, various uh, impoverished nations all around the world. So, uh, yeah. and then <laughs> you wonder why uh, people are getting uh, obese because there's just this massive amount of corn syrup and everything. It's a, uh, it's, it's a big, uh, big conundrum. Yeah. Um, but uh, but Joe William, we've uh, we've reached the end. I've just got one more question for you, and it's an open-ended question that I ask uh, all my guests. Mm -hmm. and that is, if you uh, if you could leave the audience here today with anything to keep at the back of their mind, it can be advice or a question or a book recommendation or anything. Just a little seed uh, that, uh, to stay on theme. That you, if you could plant it at the back of their mind to think about this week, uh, what would it be? Yeah, well, uh, I'll just go off the, off the first thing that came to mind. We talked about growing just one thing. Um, but just keep in mind that it, uh, don't be limited if in that advice by, you know, like uh, something edible it, or even something like that is a plant or, or, or a mushroom. Uh, it, could, it doesn't have to be that. Uh, it could be anything. It just has to be kind of like organic and, and proceeding from your own work and your own like life. <laughs> life uh life energy um uh, that's that's sort of what we're talking about uh it's it uh obviously a lot of people are limited by you know um their, the circumstances of 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 uh, where they are and and you know whatever's happening in their life right now um and so um it doesn't have to be it doesn't even have to be a plant it just has to be a, it's more it's it's about you know cultivating a mentality of uh, yourself as a human being, as a as a steward of something, which I think is the is ultimately what uh, when we when we were talking about earlier about um, about human nature, about what we're what we're on this planet for. Uh, it's for that. So uh, keep that in mind. 
Perfect. Now that's the best way to end it. Uh, thank you very much, William. And I'm just now uh, want to give you the opportunity to uh, show your content. Where can people find you, and uh, what will they find there if they if they follow these links that you're about to give them? Yes. Uh, well, um, my Twitter is Plowman's Folly. P L O U G H uh, S M A N Folly. Uh, M N M A N S Folly uh, uh, on Twitter, and. Um, uh, that's pretty much the only place that I'm really at right now. Uh, obviously, I've written uh, I've written for a bunch of different um, publications. So if you Google William Wheelwright, you'll find uh, my the articles that I've written. Uh, but yeah, please do follow me on on Twitter, and uh, you'll they'll, you'll find um, commentary on uh, agricultural matters as well as cultural matters. So excellent. Yeah. No, well, thank you very much for your time, William. It was a fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed it, and um, I also want to just thank the. The people that tuned in as well thank you for your your interesting questions and your comments um and yeah william all the best to you um uh, all the best uh or best of luck for your your mission to uh make the world a bit more uh, focused on agriculture get more people interested in this very uh, crucial side of life and i think uh, what you're doing is great and i want uh, i want you to succeed thank you very much for having me and uh please please let me know when you when you're visiting america <laughs> All right. No, I'll definitely do. And then uh, last message is the, just uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, if you are new to this channel, you can uh, subscribe for these types of conversations. You can also leave a like. It helps out the show. And then lastly, um, if you didn't watch this live, but you still want to share your thoughts, uh, you can go to the comment section, leave your thoughts there. I read all of them, respond to as many as I can. So thank you very much for, uh, for your time. Hope you have an excellent week. Uh, have an excellent weekend. Stay safe and God bless.